Hello everyone, I'm Keith Webster, the Helen and Henry Posner Jr. Dean of University Libraries at Carnegie Mellon, and I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event, Citizen Science and Community Data, Inspiring Engagement Between CMU and Local Communities. We're joined this evening by three CMU leaders who are going to share with us their passion for community-focused projects, innovative approaches to engaging communities in collecting and utilising their own data, and ideas on how those in academia can support community-led advocacy. Many thanks to my colleagues at the University Libraries who have worked behind the scenes to bring this event to you. Tonight, I'm particularly grateful to Sonia Wellington, our events manager, who looked after all of the logistics for tonight, our entire external relations team, and our moderator, Emma Slayton, our data curation, visualization, and GIS specialist in the University Libraries. I'm also grateful to our exceptional panellists who will be sharing their insight with you this evening. First, we have Mickey McGlasson, a community data scientist at Carnegie Mellon's Community Robotics, Education and Technology Empowerment, better known as CREATE Lab. He works in partnership with people and organisations across the Pittsburgh region to collect, analyse and visualise data relating to air quality, affordable housing and more. He'll share his experience working directly with community partners to collect data for a variety of initiatives. From the University Libraries, we have Saeed Chowdhury, Director of the Open Source Programs Office. Saeed brings his expertise using open science to bridge the gap between academic institutions and community organisations, especially in his previous role at Johns Hopkins University. In that role, he launched Johns Hopkins Open Source Programs Office, the first of its kind within a US university. Said was also a President Obama appointee to the National Museum and Library Services Board, and has served on a number of other boards and committees focused on science and data. Finally, we're joined by Alex Hineker, Director of Sustainability Initiative at Carnegie Mellon. Alex has guided communities from 18 different countries across the globe to understand how their data can be used to combat societal problems. And she and I works with the Carnegie Mellon community to incorporate the Sustainable Development Goals into the university's education, research and practices. And I'm very pleased that Alex has found a home in our university libraries. At the end of the evening, you'll have a chance to join in the conversation with a question and answer session. Whether you're currently a faculty member or student here at CMU, an alumnus using your research skills to make a difference, or a community member from Pittsburgh or beyond, we'd love to hear your thoughts on using data science to better centre and promote community needs. I'm especially glad to welcome to this evening's event members of our Board of Trustees and leadership and friends and colleagues from peer institutions. We hope that you can use this time to get excited about how we can all come together as a broader community to affect real change. Thank you all again for joining this this evening. Without further ado, I'll turn things over to Emma to get the discussion started. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this Tuesday evening. In our work at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries to support data education, it's become clear to us that there is a broader need and interest for our students to actively engage with our community partners. Not only do we as researchers recognize that much of the work that we do is founded on data that is provided to us by the community, but we also understand that we have a need to give back to recognize that contribution to our work. So beyond just offering the opportunities like we do at CMU Libraries for community partners to join us and do some skill training to help broaden their data skills, we recognize that it's also important for us as researchers or those who are actively engaging in community partnerships to give back by talking about their work and encouraging others to not only follow their lead, but actively engage with their projects as well as inspire work of their own. As we go through tonight, we'll be hearing from our three panelists, which Keith already lovely introduced. Um, and so as we go through um, from Mickey's introduction to his work, uh, Saeed's discussion of his role and Alex's discussion of the sustainability initiative and her other many accomplishments, I'll ask them to start by answering the question, 
what elements of your role or work involves engaging with the community and bringing to light community voices? And how does that aspect of your role um, and bring you to CMU and the work that you engage with in our university community as well? So with that, I'll pass it over to Mickey. Take it away. <laughs> All right, hi everybody. Thanks, Emma. So I'll just I'll just briefly introduce myself, talk a little bit about my background, and uh, like like Emma asked, what what brought me to CMU and so forth, and and um, and uh, tell you a little bit about the work of the organization where where I work now, which is the Create Lab. So um, I went to grad school at, at CMU at Heinz College, which uh, I'm guessing at least somebody, if not many, somebody's on on this webinar. Um, uh, you know, also did or are doing right now. Uh, had a great experience at, at Heinz College. Did that uh, several years ago. Um, worked before that in, in uh, planning for a local government uh, and worked after that in, in community and economic development um, through an organization called Fourth Economy, which is based in Pittsburgh, works all over the country uh, and does a lot of work specifically in the Pittsburgh region. Um, but what brought me to, to Pittsburgh, I mean, I'm sorry, what brought me back to, to Carnegie Mellon uh, is, is a really short answer. Um, it's the Great Lab. It's the organization where I work now. And the reason that um, I joined the Great Lab and am absolutely thrilled um, that I got the opportunity to do so is because Create is a, a really fantastic example of a university-based group that has long lasting, meaningful um, partnerships on a variety of different projects with community embedded organizations. Create's been around for um, a lot longer than I've been here for about 20 years now. Um, and, and several of the other lab members that I work with have been around for a lot of that time. Um, and the, there, there is a, the, the long list of, of projects that um, Create has developed in partnership with other groups um, demonstrates the, the genuine commitment that I think our lab tries, tries to have to doing work that is community oriented and that seeks to benefit um, not, not primarily the university, but primarily the, the community and the, the partners that we work with. Let me just highlight a couple of projects real quickly that our lab um, works on uh, right now, active projects that, that GRADE is involved in. Uh, and then, you know, as we go through the panel, I'm happy to, to discuss any of those or others, um, or just in general to discuss the kind of work that CREATE does if people have questions. So um, for starters, the, the CREATE Lab has a really strong history of working um, in environmental, in the, in, in, in the environmental justice space locally. Specifically, a lot of that work has revolved around air quality. Um, we work in partnership with a variety of different groups that are embedded in communities throughout Allegheny County and the Pittsburgh region to, um, to establish the infrastructure, the techni uh, technical infrastructure needed to collect data about air quality, to publicize and analyze data that is collected through uh, that infrastructure and, and to advocate around um, the analysis that comes out of that work um, for improved air quality in the region. Uh, Anna Hoffman and our lab leads that work and, and um, that program is, is a, to me, the, the strongest example I can come up with of what universities should be doing uh, in partnership with community groups. Um, and there's, there's a, a long history of, of work to show for it. Um, we also do a lot of work in data visualization. Uh, one, one platform that we've developed that, that is focused on data visualization is called EarthTime. That, the EarthTime platform has, has been around for a long time now, and it's gotten a lot of play internationally. Um, but we also use it locally. We use it to... Um, help local organizations uh, visualize a variety of different uh, locally focused uh, 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 data. And um, a developer in our lab right now, Harry Hawkins is working on uh, creating a, a Pittsburgh specific 
version of Earth Time that that'll be focused on just that for the Pittsburgh region. Um, a couple of other things to highlight. So we, we work in partnership with an organization called the Black Equity Coalition. That's a group that was created a few years ago in, in the immediate aftermath of the COVID pandemic, the outbreak of the COVID pandemic in the US in, in response to concerns about uh, racial equity in the Pittsburgh region um, it, during COVID. We participated in the BEC, Black Equity Coalition, BEC Data Justice Working Group since the onset and have worked in close partnership with others in that group who include representatives from the University of Pittsburgh and, um, and a variety of different um, community groups, nonprofits uh, who come together to um, look, look at data, to try to advocate around data. And while mo most of that work uh, over time has focused on um, uh, advocacy around COVID, uh, we, we're also starting to look in, 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 um, in that group at broader uh, issues of public health and uh, injustice. Um, one other thing I wanna highlight, so we, we work in partnership with the Center for Shared Prosperity, which is a, a new initiative that probably a lot of people on the webinar are, are already familiar with. Um, I'll not say too much about that yet, but if people have questions about CSP, happy to, to talk about that. Um, but, but we work with CSP-led projects um, to provide technical infrastructure, um, data visualization, other types of support. Uh, and several of our, of our staff members are, uh, spend a fair bit of time in, in partnership with CSP projects and the um, community groups that lead them. Okay, with no further ado, I'm gonna throw it to our next panelist here in a second, who I believe is Alex uh, to speak next. But uh, I'll just say happy to take any questions on on work I've done a uh, the, uh, the the create lab work that the create lab is doing. I've probably done a pretty lousy job of covering the wide variety of stuff that um, that we work on. But totally happy to talk about um, anything that people have questions about. Uh, so Alex, you're up next. Thanks, Mickey. And you know, as you were speaking, I was quietly mapping all of your work to the Sustainable Development Goals, because uh, my name is Alex Hineker, and I'm the director of the Sustainability Initiative, which is Carnegie Mellon University's commitment to incorporate uh, the Sustainable Development Goals into our education, research, and practices. If you're not familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals, they're a set of 17 global objectives that all countries agreed to achieve by 2030. And while most people think of sustainability in terms of the environment, the Sustainable Development Goals go beyond the environment to include questions of social equity and economic justice in addition to environmental factors. And at the heart of this agenda and these 17 goals is the concept of equity. And that if not everyone has access to the resources outlined in the 17 goals, then we haven't sustainably achieved them. Um, what brought me to CMU is that CMU committed to become the first university in the world to report on their um, alignment with these goals through a voluntary university review. And before coming to Carnegie Mellon University, I actually led New York City's program to um, uh, use the sustainable development goals to uh, coordinate with the United Nations as well as cities and countries around the world. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, I came up with the idea, typically people think of the sustainable development goals as something top down that comes to the United Nations, but they were actually agreed to following consultation with millions of people around the world over the course of seven years. And there's explicit recognition that cities, academia, and the private sector, as well as civil society play a really important role, but there's no clear definition of how they can engage it's considered to be at the country level of the United Nations. So while I was with the city of New York, I said, New York City is implementing all of this. We actually are doing the sustainable development goals day in, day out. So I created the concept of a voluntary local review to report on their progress toward these goals and to have a say in how um, global discussions were happening and what, what their impact was on the local level. Um, I'm excited to share that since I created the concept of the voluntary local review, more than 300 cities around the world have begun um, engaging with voluntary local reviews in um, their local governments in the United States. We, that includes Pittsburgh, uh, as well as Los Angeles, the state of Hawaii, the city of Orlando, and more cities are looking into it. 
Um, but what I want to emphasize with the goal, the goals is there are 17 goals, there are 169 targets and 252 indicators. And there's a lot of expectation that everyone has to report report perfectly on every goal. But I'm a firm believer that the sustainable development goals aren't about uh, comparing vastly different data points in different contexts. Obviously, Pittsburgh is different from Phnom Penh, that is different from um, Kigali, that is different from other places. But we can talk about is shared challenges and what we measure and why in order to achieve it. And using the common language of the sustainable development goals, I think that uh, CMU has so much to um, bring to the conversation, not only in terms of how we are conducting our operations, but also in the ways that we are educating not only our students but our faculty and staff and the type of research that we're connect uh, we're conducting so that we can we can connect what we're doing both within the university and externally with our partners here in Pittsburgh in Kigali in Doha um, nationally internationally as well as with the private sector civil society and foundations who are increasingly engaged in this work um, I want to conclude by saying that I never thought I would be working on the sustainable development goals. I spent about 15 years working in international development around the world, as Keith mentioned. And what I've seen in every place that I've lived from Pittsburgh to New York City to Phnom Penh to Laos to Lebanon is that if you don't center the perspectives and priorities of the communities with which you're partnering, you will never find a sustainable solution to the challenges that they've identified. And I think that that's really informed my approach to the sustainable development goals, both at the city of New York and what I've been doing here at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Saeed to share a little bit more about what he's working on. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, good evening, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So I will begin by saying that one of the things that drew me to CMU uh, was the Center for Shared Prosperity, uh, but I'll talk more about what drew me to CMU at the end of my remarks. Uh, my work focuses on supporting data and software systems that translate university-based research into different settings and contexts, including local communities. Universities sometimes approach working with local communities using a perspective or mindset of, we are the experts, we're here to solve your problems. I contrast this with a statement made by the Center for Shared Prosper Prosperity's executive director during their last town hall. He said the overarching mission of CSP is to give agency to the people of Pittsburgh to solve their own problems. Even with the few visits that I've paid to community centers, I've learned a lot simply by listening. I can recall a young man who said, I can hustle for a lot of things, but I can't get clothes for an interview. And when I walk in the room with the clothes that I have, they tune me out immediately. Or a homeless person saying, it's not enough to know that there's a bed available in a shelter that evening. This person needs a bed by an outlet because they have a medical device. So beyond these anecdotal stories, as we scale from the individual to the community, city, nation, and even the world, we need to reconsider how we gather, analyze, and share data. And building a sense of agency is bolstered where there's trust and transparency. I attended CMU SciLab Africa Summit last year, and one of the speakers was the health minister from Sierra Leone, who wisely said, you don't build trust at the moment of an intervention. It requires long-term engagement and commitment. So brief aside, some of you may be thinking that community engagement is a matter only for humanists or social scientists. I previously worked with researchers from the National Snow and Ice Data Center who were studying snow and ice data loss, uh, sorry, loss in Northern Alaska. Uh, they wanted to speak with village elders who had seen such loss over time. Uh, I'm told the researchers showed up and told the elders, we'd like to build a database of your temporal observations. And the village elders apparently said something to the effect of, we're not really sure what you mean, but we're happy to tell you our stories of what we've seen over our lifetimes. That's a form of data. There's tremendous untapped potential value in using more granular, disaggregated aggregated data and stories directly from our local communities to support the kind of great work that Mickey and Alex have talked about already. And open source software is a pathway for long-term engagement with local communities using transparent processes to foster trust. At my previous institution, a group of researchers and library colleagues continue to work with the local community center, the St. Francis Neighborhood Center, they're developing a set of health-based interventions, including COVID vaccine drives. A key underpinning of that project is the potential use of a platform called Makurtu, an open source software that's been used successfully to capture data and stories 
from Indigenous communities. A key question is whether Mukurtu can become a platform for building community data portals with a sense of agency that operates at national scale. So finally, what drew me to CMU? I have a background in engineering and public policy, so CMU feels like a familiar academic place in many ways. I have deep respect for the CMU libraries and I'm thrilled to be a part of the team. And finally, it's a research intensive university, but it has a service mission at its core, at its very history. And I think that's reflected in all the great work of the colleagues that I have on this panel, throughout the library, throughout the universities, at CSP, but also most importantly, in the citizens of Pittsburgh. So with that, I'll turn it back to Emma, uh, who's going to facilitate a discussion with the panel, which I'm very much looking forward to. Thank you. And thank you uh, to all of our panelists who I'll invite to return on your videos. I can now see all of your smiley faces. Uh, so we'll just jump into some pre-prepared questions while we wait for everyone in the audience to jump in with their own as well. Listening to all of your conversations about your work, one thing that became clear is centering a community voice. And much of that focus on community voice also relied on being able to access information so that that voice can be heard. Um, and we've seen this also through the White House Office of Science and Technology policy has now announced that data access is the information that we need to get out this year. It's how we need to engage with our communities. So I'm wondering for you, what role does access to information or data play in aiding community focused advocacy? Um, I think maybe if we can start with Mickey and talk a bit about the work that you do with local communities here in Pittsburgh. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Emma. So um, what role does access play? I, you know, I think data access is, is vital and it's, it's important. Uh, in any number of contexts, but it is also almost always insufficient, um, which is not to say that that we shouldn't care about access to data. It's just that we shouldn't only care about access to data. Um, and there there are probably a lot of labels for what you know the other parts of that equation that make um, this type of work successful, but the um, the, the the word for me that is most important beyond access is partnership. Mm -hmm. It's it's ha having strong and lasting partnerships with groups um, that you know are are founded in trust and allow uh, technical experts to be responsive to the needs of community groups, which are never going to be static. Uh, you know, are are constantly changing and um and it, it, you know i think i think the the story Saeed, that you just that you just tell like we have uh, uh, that you just told in your introduction there um we have stories you know that some version of that translates into any number of different domains it translates into local work um too often the dynamic that technical experts whether from universities or not um bring to the to the table when it comes to data open data um is uh, is access only it's here here's the data you're welcome uh, and i think partnerships are the other vital side of that equation I, I couldn't agree more mickey we really need to make sure that it's not just having that access to the data it's about how we center that access and the partnerships that can derive from it. And I'm so glad that you referenced Saeed in your response, because I was also going to pass that question over to Saeed as well, particularly in thinking through your work with communities in terms of gathering data from them as well, but also in then creating these spaces where data can be more accessible and, and maybe framing it a bit too. And, and what Mickey just mentioned about the centering of partnerships is an important aspect in that space. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll turn the mirror on myself for a second, if you don't mind. Uh, so I spent two years working for the UN in Bangladesh, and I was part of a group called the Flood Action Plan, and we had the ambitious goal of modeling the rivers of Bangladesh. Um, that it remains a, an unsolved problem. But uh, I remember uh, running these models in a central office in the capital city of Dhaka, and then uh, hearing reports from the field 
of people basically going to earthen, you know, kind of uh, embankments and so on, poking holes in them. And I would say, well, why are people doing that? Th this is why our models don't work. There must be lots of fall, you know, leakage and so on. And they said, well, they're doing it to irrigate their farms, right? So here you have this central office trying to model rivers in Bangladesh, and then on the ground you have people doing what they do to, in order to survive. And and I think what we find is that when there are shocks to the system, COVID, for example, was certainly a shock to the system. There's a gap between well-meaning national, state-level policies, actions, allocations, so on, and making an impact in people's lives. Uh, I was reminded, you know, by, of an economics professor I've had who said, you know, for all our modeling and data, don't forget to look for help wanted ads in, in your local stores and your restaurants. That's a great indicator of what's happening in the economy. So that gap from the national perspective or large scale perspective, dare I say, the academic research perspective into everyday lives is a gap we need to address. And I think that has to happen by actually asking people what's on their mind, what the problems are, how they would go about solving them, and then building open transparent systems so they can trust them, that we're not gathering your data and doing something you know, nefarious with it, uh, that we're actually doing something that will help advance the problems you've identified. Well, that's a great point, Saeed. I do think that we need to think about looking to what is it the community needs and listening to them tell us rather than trying to enforce those views there. And I'm so glad to see Alex very excited about that response as well, because I was going to turn it to you. So Sayed so just mentioned that local information and perspectives are so important in this work as well. We can't just have top down data driven collection needs. And in your introduction, you mentioned how the SDGs, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, can apply both coming down from the UN, but also looking at local partnerships and local commissions to try to identify ways to address those needs. I thought maybe you could speak a bit on that. Yeah, I just first want to say that one of the reasons I was looking so forward to this conversation is I couldn't agree more with what Mickey and Saeed just said. <laughs> I totally support it. But um, I think that what's really interesting about the sustainable development goals is something that a lot of people suffer from is what I term um, framework fatigue. There are so many frameworks out there and there are so many different ways to approach things and think about data and what you should collect and why. Um, and I don't think, I certainly don't think that the sustainable development goals have captured every single thing in every single way. But what is remarkable about them is that they are this universally accepted. Like I can't express to you how incredible it is that 193 countries agree that open government and peace, justice, and strong institutions are critical aspects of sustainability. So it's a starting point for us to think about how we talk about these issues and why. But I absolutely absolutely do not think that we should ever go into a community where I go up to someone and say, have you heard about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? It's 17 objectives agreed to by all. As people that are engaging with these partners, I think the onus is on us to make that translation between what we recognize are the frameworks that we can use to apply our research or um, advocacy to um, other aspects and then determine how we can collect the information at the city. So for example, in the city of New York, when I did the voluntary local review, I wasn't going out and asking New Yorkers what they thought about the sustainable development goals. I was asking our city agency partners, I think that you're contributing to this, this, and this, and this is the way you're engaging with your constituents. And I helped look at the policy, the overall policy about um, how they were measuring engagement. It was not my responsibility to go out and engage with the different communities across New York for this. And I think it's really important to remember that as excited as we may be about these frameworks, they're not universally um, acknowledged by everyone and we don't need to apply them that way. Yeah, so true. And I, I think that exactly right. It relates back to what Mickey is saying about listening to local partners and centering their perspectives and how we think about not only data accessibility or data collection, but also how people end up using the information that researchers provide or that they collect themselves. Um, and so since we just were talking about centering our community partners' voices, I'm wondering if you might be able to share some of your experience working with community partners and, and maybe discuss the most unique or positive example of a project you have that involves a community partner or community collected data for citizen science collaboration. Uh, perhaps maybe Alex, do you wanna go just based on your experience in working with New York or one of the other locations you mentioned earlier? 
Sure. Um, I think something that has actually informed my entire approach and worldview is working on the international campaign to ban landmines. Here's a situation where we had governments in Geneva saying that landmines were a critical weapon of their arsenal. They absolutely needed to be used to win wars, so on and so forth in the 90s. But the people living in the countries where the landmines were being deployed said, actually, the vast majority of casualties are civilians. Civilians are suffering from this. They're not militarily uh, useful, and you're not reaching your objectives by harming civilians. So what happened was the international campaign got together, collected information and stories from all of these different countries where landmines were used, brought it to the decision makers, um, and said, you know, this isn't the reality on the ground. This is actually what's happening. They partnered together with supportive governments. Canada took this on, um, developed the Ottawa process to ban landmines. And we now have an international treaty banning this weapon, and it's used by only the worst of the regimes these days. And that's because the people impacted by landmines stood up and said, this is how it's um, this is how it's impacting us, and we are going to be part of the conversation. And uh, it was really important in that case, not only for them to be part of it, but to recognize the role that different actors could play. So we had supportive national governments. We had the United Nations agencies that were able to facilitate the technical expertise. We had civil society in terms of the people living in the countries that were impacted. And we had civil society in countries like the United States advocating in Washington, D.C. for them to um, uh, take part in these conversations and understand what was going on in the ground. And that was that was uh, really impactful for me. And that's always the reference point when I go back to when I think about how tough things are and how important it is to um, keep at it to actually make meaningful change. Definitely. And, and building off of that example, mentioning the involvement of several different levels of institutions. So we're talking about local governments or other active agents, maybe some federal involvement. And it reminds me, Said, of when you were talking about the different levels of involvement or engagement at an institution level to the places that are collecting data. You mentioned your project in Bangladesh, but you also mentioned your work in Johns Hopkins. So I'm wondering if you also have an interesting project you'd like to expand more on as an example of a fun or impactful way that communities were able to actually impact the data that they live with. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I will talk about uh, the project at Johns Hopkins, but I'll give a reference point to something that I uh, learned about the Center for Shared Prosperity and work in, in Pittsburgh. And I think, you know, Mickey, you're probably involved in this around the monitoring of air pollution in Allegheny County. And, you know, as you say, providing you know, ways to visualize that data. But I read in one of the articles that even though masks and filters and so on are offered for free, there's a reluctance to actually take advantage of those interventions or, or you know, sort of responses. A parallel, if you will, metaphor in Baltimore was there was reluctance to take COVID vaccines in this community center, even though we said Hopkins is willing to come and a physician is willing to administer, administer these to you. And I'm, I'm not picking on my former institution. I think this is true of many universities. There, there's a serious lack of trust and a fractured relationship with some community members in the university. Uh, and it's just, it's just a historical fact that some of the medical researchers at Hopkins previously experimented or, or did you know, treatments without consent and so on. Um, so that story is passed down from generation to generation, and that's what you're up against. So what we did in this project instead was the researchers started having this, you know, reading group, monthly reading group, where any in the, one in the community is invited to join. And everyone was treated as a peer and an equal. And this, you know, not only is about knowledge sharing and transfer and so on, but it's just getting to know each other. And then one of the researchers held a series of data literacy workshops at the community center, went there and said, this is the data, this is how you might want to read this, this is generally important. That's and then the Hopkins physician showed up with the COVID vaccines. Uh, and I remember one community member actually saying, I'm not even here for the vaccine, I'm just here to see a Hopkins doctor. I never thought I'd see a Hopkins doctor in my life. So getting to that point takes a lot of effort and sort of unlearning what you think you may know and with this of, you know, here's the data, here's the analysis, why would you not take advantage uh, of this? It's really important to unpack all these complicated issues. Absolutely. And I think it hits back to the same idea that's been coming up continually and that we need to listen to what the community needs um, and what projects they're most interested in engaging, which was, I think, and also you hinted at, Said, is the goal of the Center for Shared Prosperity. How do we bring the Pittsburgh community 
um, to be full partners with the work that we're doing at Carnegie Mellon as researchers. And speaking of CSP, I'm interested, Mickey, to hear about any projects that you're working on with them that might be interesting. I know you mentioned earlier uh, the programs on air quality uh, that Sayed also referenced, as well as working with the community for um, Black equity. Do you have another example you might want to share? Yeah, so um, just just briefly on, on CSP, um, there, there are several um, in the language of CSP launch projects that have, have um, started over the last now year and a half. Um, CSP for me is a, is a uh, and let me just say it again, Center for Shared Prosperity, the Center for Shared Prosperity, uh, CSP, sorry for using the abbreviation, but um, that is a really uh, in interesting model for how a university might relate to the community around it. And it's just getting started. So there, there are several projects that ha have, uh, you know, kicked off many more to come. There's a, um, the, the, the CSP is led by a, 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 what's called the Center Community Committee or C3, which is a group of representatives that meet regularly to come up with these, these project ideas and, and advance them and, and um, you, you know, tr try to understand how in any given case, a project could uh, create systemic change in the local uh, community. And the idea that a university could be kind of a canvas for that without, uh, and, a, and a support agent in that without um, dictating what those projects um, end up being or, or how, they, you know, how they progress, for me is where the really exciting um, element of, uh, elements of CSP lie. Uh, and, and I think that's a new, that's a genuinely new thing that you don't see in many other university contexts. But like I said, it, it's also um, it's also new, and 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 uh, it's like being created as we talk. You know, this this year is a big year for CSP, as will next year be when when some of these projects that have just started to launch come into um, really come into being in in, in stronger ways. And and uh, and I, I think. Probably the um, a message that's important for the audience uh, of this webinar. If you are local, if you're in Pittsburgh, if you're part of the CMU community, now is a great time to get involved in that work. If that's something that you're interested in, um, and to to help shape what some of those projects look like, what the what those um, relationships with community organizations look like, and and so forth. Um, and then briefly on the the, the Black Equity Coalition, in the, um, so the, the BEC is a group that is also really, I think, an interesting model for a, a collaborative organization. It was not, it was kind of the opposite of CSP in one way. CSP was the product of a lot of thought. It was, a, it was the product of smart people sitting down and saying, like, how can we do things differently and better? And um, BBC was the product of urgent need in a crisis. Um, it was it was the product of of a pandemic that was novel to everyone experiencing it, and um, very legitimate fear around what that might mean for um, equity in this region, what what it might mean for equitable health outcomes in this region, and. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting to be involved in two different things that have, have very different origin stories in that way, but which both have similar strengths in terms of um, the depth of relationships that, that they have fostered, the role that, you know, and, and especially the role that universities play in both of those organizations. Not that it's the same role, but in both cases, the university is not deciding what happens. And that that's, that's I think, a model that CMU hit other schools in Pittsburgh and schools around the world uh, can should seek to emulate, um, to be a partner without being uh, in charge. Absolutely. And I think from what we've heard from everyone on this panel, it's exciting that we get to be here at CMU where these programs are developing and we can really make some of that change happen. And I just want to highlight again, 
Could you also uh, ch uh, check out the link to the Center for Shared Prosperity page uh, in the chat right now? Because as Mickey mentioned, there are projects, there might be projects you want to recommend. So please do engage with that. Um, and speaking about hearing uh, from the community or directly giving your input to that, I think it's time for us to move on to some of our community questions from everyone who's joined us tonight. And one of the questions that I see is for Mickey. Um, and it is basically asking, do you work with public libraries within or around Pittsburgh to affect data driven community initiatives relating to social equity and allied aspects? Yeah, I'm not I'm um, I'm in the minority of people on this panel who do not work at a <laughs> library in some form or fashion. So uh, I might not be the perfect person to answer that question. But um, I think public libraries in Pittsburgh, um, public libraries anywhere are a vital resource to a community. Uh, in Pittsburgh, that's especially true because of the strength of the library system locally. Uh, I have I have done some work um, through the um, Allegheny County Library Network um, to it, it, um, in in my past role to um, make libraries. Uh, physical space available for a variety of different programmatic functions. Um, I think libraries are one example of what could be many different types of community scale institutions where there is an opportunity to better um, utilize existing physical spaces, um, digital infrastructure, and, and just institutional knowledge networks um, to uh, in any type of project that involves mobilizing a community or disseminating information to a community. I think libraries are a great example of an institution that's good at doing that and, and, and they're not alone on that list. Thanks for the question. And I, I think that was a great answer. And I mean, as someone who works in libraries myself, always excited to hear when people are wanting to engage with us. And I, I wonder if I could pass that over then too to, to you, Saeed, as someone who's had a long history of working in libraries. Yeah. What, what do you feel the role of libraries is in this space? Yeah, I, I'm actually going to refer to experiences. I, had. I think Keith mentioned that I, I was on the National Museum and Library Services Board for a time. And one of the really uh, wonderful aspects of being on that board is, uh, is providing the national uh, service awards to libraries and museums. So we would receive applications from a wide variety of libraries throughout the country. Uh, so I had an opportunity to see public libraries, research libraries, you name it, uh, and, and museums and galleries and so on. And just to echo and reinforce Mickey's point that so many of these spaces are community centers in their own way. Uh, gathering spaces where people are doing job applications, you know, interview skills, whatever you want to, you know, you need to, to get the job. And they do provide those kinds of, I would call essential services, but that's a pathway to more of the information type of services or, or literacy that we're talking about on this panel, right, is that you may come in for one particular function, but that's a great pathway or an opportunity to say, hey, are you aware that, you know, you may be interested in this job, but these are things you might want to know about this particular topic, or there are other kinds of topics that may be of interest to you. Uh, and I don't want to, you know, put Alex on the spot or tell her what to say or so on, but the whole sustainability space that, 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 that are in the Carnegie Mellon libraries to me is a great example of how research libraries can play that role as well. Uh, so I see her nodding, so maybe I'll just stop and let her jump in. Well, just to add to that, when I applied for the job at the city of New York back in 2017, they asked me to bring in an example of how we could amplify the sustainable development goals in New York City. And I said public libraries and rolled out a whole sample strategy for how we could do this with public libraries. Of course, I was based in the International Affairs Office, um, and I'm not sure if I emphasize enough that CMU um, in 2019, the provost came to New York and I heard him speak about CMU's commitment to the sustainable development goals. And that's actually what made me think, hmm, maybe it's time for me to see what's happening in higher ed with these additional opportunities with education and research. And over the past two years, this has been a provost priority, but he together with Dean Webster recognized the central role that the university libraries play across campus as a convening place, um, as a source of uh, information for current collections and also our archival information. So it's a perfect spot for us to set up the sustainability studio, which is a 
place for um, students, faculty, staff, alumni, and the Pittsburgh community to come together to learn about the sustainable development goals and to do various um, activities and participate in different sorts of uh, um, convenings to identify how their work is related to these goals and how they can connect with other partners within and outside of the university to help advance this agenda. Um, and I just love being in the libraries because I'm surrounded by people who are incredibly knowledgeable and very passionate about sharing it. So every time someone comes to me with a question, I've mapped everything to the sustainable development goals and I can find the relevant partner, whether it's um, a faculty member, a staff member, um, another teacher, to see how they can help uh, answer the questions that someone may have that are related to the relevant sustainable development goals. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have the same enthusiasm about working in libraries, and I also so enjoy that a lot of the content that we make available for our students and faculty here at CME is equally available to the community, um, and we'll plug some workshops that anyone from the community can attend later as well. Um, but thinking about the libraries as a partner in this process, it makes me wonder about other partnerships, and we did talk about focusing less on here's the data and more on here's how we can work together with the data or, or better understand it based on community needs. Um, but we do have a question from the chat that wonders if we might be able to further describe how partnerships work. Um, does it include data interpretation and guidance, offering implications and impacts of what data reveals? Um, does it involve working with data education? Are there other components of a partnership that it's important for community members to know when they're looking to connect? Um, anybody wanna uh, would jump in on that question or should I call names? You know, okay, uh, I'm curious, Nikki. Yeah, I know you and I have talked a lot about the need for building data visualization skills in the community. And you mentioned something earlier that a lot of the ways that you focus on building partnerships or letting the community in on some of the content that has been developed through partnerships is through communication and data visualization. Do you want to maybe talk about partnerships at that level as well? Yeah, sure. Um, th thanks again for that question. I think that's that's important. Um, too often in um, these sorts of contexts, we can we kind of like skirt by on vague words, you know, partnerships and community and things that sound nice, but um, are hard when you get into the the details and and partnership is a great example of that um, because it's not it's not easy to be a good partner when it comes to technical work um, i don't think there's a short answer um, i think it's it's it, um, at the risk of sounding like i'm ducking the question i think it's all all of the above to a certain extent right sometimes it's it's a, being a good partner um, if you're coming from a technical space like a university and you're working with an organization without a lot of technical capacity, uh, you know, uh, I think sometimes what it what it looks like is um, partly educational and and partly um, you know like just providing providing services. Like you you need you you have this data and you need some sort of visual representation of it. Let me work with you to understand what. Um, that you you know you you expect it to look like and and try to provide you with something that's useful to your purposes. That's a that's a form of partnership for sure. Um, I think good partnerships, um, good organizational partnerships, are built on shared interest um, and are are in, involve a genuine reciprocity of of. Um, skills and information knowledge if the dynamic is we at the university have um, you know tech, technical skills and knowledge and we are here to bestow them upon you great you know uh, graciously bestow them upon you community organizations then we are approaching this work um, not just not just wrong wrongly from a moral perspective we're we're missing an opportunity um, to do work better you know, to, to learn, which is theoretically the, you know, a, a pretty central uh, focus of most universities, at least on paper, right, to learn. And I think, I think that is the harder part of partnership um, to, to really do, honestly, but, I, but I, I, you know, I think that's, that has to be part of the mix too, a genuine exchange of, of, of knowledge and ideas 
let us work through this thing together. And I have certain skills and backgrounds and you have certain skills and, and backgrounds and between the two of us, we, we make a better team. You know, that's, that's what partnership is in any context. And there's no reason why it should be different when it comes to working with data. Absolutely. And I, oh, Saeed, did you want to add something as well? Uh, I, I was just going to follow up, but if you have a comment, I can wait until then. No, pl please no. go ahead. Yeah, I, um, uh, uh, truth be told, when I told my uh, graduate advisor I was going to work in the library, he said, why? <laughs> uh, because I wasn't in engineering and program. And I, I said, well, you, you said to me early on when I said, what, what am I supposed to do in grad school? He said, I don't want you to figure out a particular set of things. I want you to learn how to learn. Uh, and what I said to him was, I can't think of a better organization that helps you learn how to learn than the library. And he said, well, nicely done. Good luck. Have a good career. So I, I think libraries are really wonderful places to help people explore data, information, services, people, resources, you name it, collections. Uh, and there's no agenda. Right? You, you, nobody walks into a library and is told, you must come to this conclusion. You must come to this answer. It's very much helping you navigate that. But, but to do so in a way that reflects sound methods and you know solid principles and ethics and values and so on. And then to amplify that through a network of libraries and library information science schools and so on. And that's not only in terms of the content and the way you navigate the content, but it's also the infrastructure, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm, my, my dog has an opinion on these topics, obviously. Um, but if you think about that kind of McCurtu platform I was talking about, a series of community data portals, are libraries potentially the place that provide the infrastructure for those? So I think that kind of network effect is something libraries can bring into the mix as well. No, absolutely. And I think to both those points, having worked in libraries just in six years, also coming from a research background where my PhD supervisor was very surprised I was moving into libraries, but making the jump for the same reason, since I want to help people better understand and access information about their lives. It's something that we can think about how places that are focused on education function and actually provide a service and provide support to some of those partnership elements that you were talking about, Mickey, as well. And how can we help education get out? as that should be the role of a university. Um, but thinking about people coming from outside the university, Alex, I'm interested to hear about aspects that you've worked in for these kind of partnership networks and how that can relate to education or other roles and partnerships. Sure. Uh, one other area where I'm working using the sustainable development goals regionally is as a member of the steering committee of Discover, which is a network of organizations about three dozen organizations convened by Sustainable Pittsburgh that are going through every single sustainable development goal target to determine how the um, these groups regionally are contributing to each of the targets and how do we define success in each of these targets. Um, it's been a series of long meetings over several years in order to ensure that everyone's perspective is heard and that the local priorities of our partners here in Pittsburgh are reflected in the targets that we talk about when we talk about the sustainable development goals in this region. Um, and I think that that's really helpful to ensure that we are able to communicate with local organizations using this common language of the sustainable development goals because at CMU we're increasingly looking at it internally and also there are opportunities with um, the city of Pittsburgh, which I mentioned has published two voluntary local reviews, and other cities, states, and countries around the world. Um, and I, I just, I want, oh, and I'm excited to share, there was a question about foundations that the Pittsburgh Foundation is actually supporting our work. And there are lots more community foundations, including the Cleveland Foundation, the um, Central Florida Foundation, and a few others that are actually internally looking at how the sustainable development goals can be a tool for them to determine when and how they prioritize their funding and how they um, identify future potential um, grantees. Yeah, excellent. I think you're you're hitting the nail on the head here, Alex, that a lot of this work is just beginning, um, not only in terms of how we think about the SDGs and apply them to community partnerships, but also if we look internally at CMU with the new initiatives that Mickey, you were mentioning coming out of the Center for Shared Prosperity, 
this is all an exciting time where things are happening and we can actually engage and take that ownership as people who are invested in supporting community missions. Um, and speaking of thinking through the future of how community partnerships and citizen science are going to work within the context of CMU. I'm wondering if any of our panelists have thoughts on where this is heading in the next five years. How can CMU evolve to better work with community partners uh, to support access to data or education that can help citizen science advocacy? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I, I think to everything you've heard on this panel and, and much, much more, of course, throughout the university, CMU is doing a wonderful job. And I agree with Mickey, this is not typical for universities to have communities as true and equal partners. I, I, I'd love to see over the next five years, and I believe it will happen, uh, that it moves from gathering data or sort of working with communities to figure out what you know the data are, the problems are, to actively including them in solving those problems, right? So it isn't this process of here's the data, here's the problem, and now we go off and do all the analysis and give it back to you, but rather there's like a shared uh, sense of solving the problems together, you know, through data analytics, all kinds of kinds of things, and to do that in, in true partnership with the community. What about you, Mickey? Next five years, what's going to happen? Yeah. yeah, I, I, the thing that I would most like to see happen in the next five years. So that's maybe a slightly different answer than the question. But the thing I would most hope will happen, uh, and I, and I also think it will happen, is um, that the student population of CMU, which is already, to some extent, a, a you know, an engaged student population in the local community. Um, Will, will become more so. I mean, the, the, I think it will be harder to be a student at CMU and to not have at least in your face opportunities to be engaged um, in the community around you in a, in a meaningful way through, uh, you know, whatever it is that you're studying in school. Um, I think that, I'm not saying that doesn't exist now, but I think that will exist more and more prominently in the next five years. And I'm very hopeful about that. I think that would be a really, a really, um, that would be an that would be an enormous thing for the university to achieve um, if if it if it can in in to a significant degree more strongly engage students um, through their academic work through through other opportunities in in the community around the university. And uh, just to piggyback on that, I think I remember you mentioning that there might be some open internships or opportunities for students to get involved even now. Did you want to mention that briefly or? Yeah, sure. It, um, if you're a student on this call and you're interested in, in doing this type of work, um, uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. The, the Create Lab often has interns. The Center for Shared Prosperity also works with undergrad students to place them um, on different in different support roles for the, the projects that are going through the Center for Shared Prosperity. So there already exists lots of opportunities to get engaged if you are a CMU student right now. Um, yeah. Great. All right. And then Alex, next five years, what are, what are we hoping for? What are we seeing? Well, in partnership with the work that uh, Mickey and Saeed just mentioned, I'm hoping that uh, our colleagues at CMU think more um, comprehensively about the impact of their work beyond the specific topic that they're working on. And the sustainable development goals can be a way to unlock, unlock those conversations. Not that everyone has to be addressing all 17 goals when they're looking at um, their objectives for their research or engagement, but rather thinking through the you know, you're focusing on clean water and sanitation. How is that related to sustainable cities and communities, good health and well-being? How is that related to quality education? And having an understanding of how those different parts fit together, I think will only make us all stronger students, researchers, and members of the community. I'd be remiss not to mention the Nexus on Civic Engagement, which I am a part of, which is a new initiative by Carnegie Mellon University to um, strengthen community engagement between um, the university students, as well as faculty and staff, and um, our partners in the Pittsburgh community. And I think that they're a great resource for people looking to get engaged in the Pittsburgh community as well. Absolutely. And I love that we're 
coming to a close on action items that people can take away. Uh, and I have a couple more action items for everyone. But first, I want to thank all of our panelists for being a part of this wonderful event. I know that I've learned a lot about ways that I can do more to be a better partner to the CMU community by learning from all of you. And I look forward to having more conversations on these topics moving forward. Uh, I also want to thank everyone again who put time into planning this event um, and to everyone who attended, but just to let you know that there are other ways that you can continue to engage with us on the topic of community data and citizen science being full partners with our uh, efforts here. Um, one of those is through a series of workshops that will be happening at the Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. Now we've talked about libraries as a center for education. Well, here's some ways that you can actively learn. Those workshops are going to be made available for anyone in the community to attend. You just have to register and they're free. Uh, so I hope to see some of you all at those events. Um, other events that are coming up through the libraries include three minute thesis where you can also learn not only how our students might be engaging with the community, but the research that our students are doing more broadly through their studies. It's uh, 3MT is an internationally recognized celebration of research that challenges PhD students to present a compelling oration on their thesis and its significance in three minutes and in language that anyone can understand. So again, it's a great way to talk about how students can speak to the community. Uh, it's the event is happening on Tuesday, February 28th. Um, CMU PhD students representing a variety of research areas will take part on the stage to discuss these topics and even possibly win cash prizes. So the event is also free, much like the workshops, and is open to the public. It's also a hybrid event with an in-person and virtual uh, option for attendance. And you can find a registration link in the chat to that now. Finally, you can tell that the libraries are very invested in building connections between the university and the community through workshops, through events like 3MT. But if you would like to support us in those efforts, um, please consider uh, giving a gift to the CMU Libraries Dean's Discretionary Fund. Um, there's a link provided in the chat. Your donations can strengthen our vital role as a convener of interdisciplinary activities and a central gathering place for the CMU community to have on-campus wide conversations and conversations that also include our community partners. With that, again, thank you very much for attending this event, and I hope you all have a pleasant evening.